guys, I'm Jeff. I'm one really of the pastors here, and I'm really excited because I'll show up some standing here. I'm really looking for the first time. This is my first time preaching to you live. I'm only really recorded here for the last time. But we're going to start a new sermon series, so I'm glad to kick this off with us. And our fearless leader, Adam, and here you go. Instead of just preaching through the passages of the familiar series of Advent, we thought we'd make it more personal. This is a new team, and we don't know many of our stories. And for me, I love hearing stories. So we thought that it'd be great to just personalize the sermon by having us share our personal stories in the way that God can visit us, in the same way that God can visit some of these characters. So I'm excited. So I want to hear stories, and also it makes me excited to know that you guys have stories. It's the beautiful thing about being in church, to see how we're all connected, and how we can be guided to continue to connect our stories. So before we jump in, let me just pray for us. God, we have spoken to you in this place. As we begin the service here today, we ask, Lord, let this be a new season for us. As we begin to combine our churches, as we begin to move into a new season of life, as we begin to even see changes in our city, in our own lives, in our work, in our families. Just thank you. As we begin fresh. And now we just ask the Holy Spirit to come. Fill this place with your presence. We ask that you begin to remove any barriers. Lock the word in reaching our hearts and minds. Now you can do this by saying, Yes, Lord, we just want to do this by saying, In the name of the Father, Son, Spirit, we pray. Amen. How's it going? Do you want to come in? Yeah, just pop it out a little bit. Better? Yeah. Now you can't hear me. How's this? Yeah. All right. You know, whenever we come to this season uh, in New York, I always have these two songs playing in my head. The first one is, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas. Right? <laughs> and the second one is, it's the most wonderful time of the year. Right? And it's funny because I don't actually really celebrate Christmas that well. In fact, I don't celebrate any holidays well at all. And Eric calls me the Grinch every year without a day. <laughs> it's because I didn't have a normal childhood. See, I, uh, I didn't grow up celebrating with my family. Every year, without fail, from the age of 6 to 24, I would spend my time at our family's liquor store. And we'd work. It wasn't like a short shift. I'd work 13 hours, two days in a row. Thanksgiving, Black Friday, Christmas Eve, Christmas, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. So when I knew all my friends, hanging out with their family, hanging out with each other, exchanging gifts, I knew where I was going. I was going working. And I just didn't look forward to that. And so I only changed when I got married. And I was thrust into this brand new world of celebrating traditions with her family. And I was like, it was awkward. So awkward. The first Christmas, I sat on her mom's staircase, staring at her as if it's changing gifts. And I had no idea what to do with myself. I was like, am I supposed to participate? I didn't buy anything. <laughs> but nonetheless, throughout the years, I feel like I've gotten better. I know what to do, I know how to act, and because I'm a pastor, now they ask me to pay for every meal, every meal, every meal. <laughs> so I feel welcome. And I get it. I get why people look forward to this holiday. I get why everybody suddenly feels better in the mood and faces. I mean, walking here this morning, it's snowing. <laughs> it's beautiful. And then the trees are going to come up, and the decorations and the lights. Who doesn't like that, right? Eric and I, we just put up our tree in that slide. We actually put it up uh, earlier in November, I think, right? Jeff, can you like, show that slide in our tree? <laughs> <It's not. laughs> yeah, it's a little tree. We've had that thing for, what, nine years, I think? We first got it from there, it's plastic. I'm allergic to pine needles. Eric didn't believe me at first. In fact, no one believed me. So I started breaking out in hives one year. And even this day, I was just believing me. She's wondering, how do I fake this allergic? Actually, right? <laughs> so it's plastic. We love it. It's a tradition for us. Not this thing, up. And we love collecting ornaments. And so everybody has something to look forward to. But last year, last year was terrible, wasn't it? Christmas just 
wasn't the Christmas anymore. This is the pandemic. You couldn't travel anywhere, you could barely see friends. The city was basically shut down. So this year, don't we have such higher expectations for this Christmas that we get to actually celebrate the way we are supposed to, the way we want to? Then we look forward to it, don't we? And it helps us get through another rough day or another hard day at work or school. It's important as a call it hope. We have to make sure we always have hope because when we lose it, often it becomes just difficult to do the simplest things, like live. In the 1950s, there was this famous experiment done by a guy named Kurt Rickman. Uh, this experiment that was dubbed the whole experiment. And what he did is he put rats in buckets of water, and he would actually time them to see how long they would tread water before they gave up on the ground. Kind of gruesome. And he hypothesized, he thought, well, as an experiment, the kinds of rats he used with wild ones and domesticated ones. He thought the wild ones would actually outswim and outlast the domesticated ones because of their high instinct and will to survive. But he was surprised. He found that the domesticated guys actually swam longer before they died. So he thought about this. What is this one thing that might cause domesticated rats to swim longer? He thought, Maybe it could be something dealing with the pulp. Because the rats in the wild were constantly living in a state of survival. Every day they had to do something just to make it through and find their next meal. So he tested it. He put the same rats in the bucket, and instead of letting them drown, right before they could give up, he pulled them out, dried them off, and let them rest. And then he put them back in, and tied them again. And to his surprise, he discovered that both sets of rats were swimming. Long. In fact, the longest one spent for 60 hours, 60 zero. By his calculations, that was 250% longer than the original. Than anyone, any of the rats that came through intervention at all, anyway, they were able to swim longer because someone had suddenly saved them, even if it was just once. He concluded by writing this saying, after the elimination of hopelessness, the rats do not die. There's one thing that I learned from this experiment. That the rats here in New York City have way too much hope, right? They're just way too much hope. <laughs> <laughs> Let me think about this for a second. We compare ourselves to rats that don't do that. The rats here have a much different level of intelligence, especially emotional intelligence. If for them, living without hope causes them to give up in seconds, what us? What is it like for us to live without it? In our passage today, we're going to be introduced to a man that is going to experience that. Hopelessness. Everything he had hoped for, dreamed about, is going to be taken. And in that one moment, he has to make a decision. In his confusion, he has to figure out what to do in his hopelessness. What's he doing? Then we become the adoptive father of the Son of God, Joseph. Now, it's funny, when we read about Joseph, there's almost nothing revealed about this guy. In fact, he doesn't say a single word in the Bible. But he's an important, very important character, isn't he? We're only told three direct things about him in Scripture. First, in the previous chapter of what I read, there's a genealogy of Jesus. We find that he's a direct descendant of King David. Now, this is something that Joseph would have been deeply proud of, his entire family would be proud of, because it's a story that would have passed down from generation to generation to Joseph. Because to that day, the Jews and Israelites still believed that a king, a Messiah, would come and deliver them from their oppression, and they're waiting for So Joseph knew this story. Second thing we're told, in the NIV, it says that he's faithful to the law. He used to be used the word righteous and just. It just simply means that Joseph knew the scriptures very well. And that he would know also the story that was passed down to him very well. And he lived it out loud. Finally, the third one is that we know that he's betrothed or pledged to marry. And for us, technically, this is more than just engaging. The They're already legally married. So what that means is the wedding is set, the venues are already picked up. 
the menu is done, right? Like the food is good, the taste is all. The invitation is set, the guests are excited to celebrate with their very big day. Then suddenly, Mary comes and drops a bombshell. Scandalous secret. She's pregnant. And Joseph's not the father. Cue in Dr. Phil here, right? This is the moment where you're making dramatic. The Bible is such a great reading. So much better than drama. And to make it even better, the Father's not even a man. It's the Holy Spirit. I mean, come on, that's not fair. How can Joseph get mad at that, right? The Holy Spirit, you're going to get in my life. What can you do? Let's put ourselves in Joseph's shoes for a second. What do you think he's feeling? This is a good man. By all accounts, he should be able to find love. He should be able to get married to talk about it, to talk about the truth. And in this one moment, all of it is powerful. I'd say his world is quickly crumbling, isn't it? Crushing. And not just him. As he's dealing with this, he's probably thinking about his family. How are they going to react? She can share this news. Mary's family, what are they going to do? All of them have these high hopes and expectations for their marriage. Now, it's gone. And the pastor says in verse 20 that Joseph considered these things. In fact, every translation in English is the word considered is used. And it comes from the Greek word to think or to ponder. And it makes me realize that Joseph doesn't just come to a decision immediately to divorce Mary. He says, and if I really, really imagine myself as Joseph, I think he's tormenting himself over a decision. He's agonizing over every last detail of the potential of what could be. Right? Is Mary lying to me? Because if she is, I'd be made a fool if I marry her. But what if she's not? What if, what if I end up divorcing her? And she really is impregnated by the Holy Spirit. Because then if I kill her because the punishment of adultery was thrown in. So he might end up murdering and currently marry an unborn child. But then again, what if I'm wrong? What if I'm wrong and Mary is lying to me? And I'm either full of it, and everyone knows, and my entire family is also embarrassed. Not to mention the secrecy that I have to live in. See, Joseph, he's so torn apart, he's so tired. And as he's wrestling with his thoughts, Pastor tells us that he passes out. Falls asleep. And that's when the angel comes to Joseph in a dream. I just want to pause here for a second. When we read the Bible and we come to passages like this, it's both easy and difficult. It's both helpful and detrimental to us. Because as believers, we know the story, we know the outcome. We know and we believe that in this story, the Messiah is born from us, and Jesus is going to grow up and become our Savior. But sometimes when we compare the story and the message here to the context and situations of our lives, sometimes it just don't match up, do they? Sometimes it's just not that simple. Sometimes we wish an angel would come to us and tell us what to do. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. Maybe my faith is just so small <laughs> that when my reality is crashing down on me, it's just hard to believe that God's there at all. I mentioned earlier I didn't have a normal childhood. Uh, you know, growing up, my family, we're very Asian. So we didn't tell each other that we loved each other. Uh, and I, my parents were told that they were proud of us. Uh, they never hugged us really. We knew they loved us because they, they gave us food, they gave us clothes, they let us to school. <laughs> That's how we knew we were loved. Um, not only that, but working so much for them. That was basically our lives, work. I developed this bitterness and resentment because I knew what my friends were doing. And my older brother, uh, he worked even longer than me. Seeing him also made me resentful because I just saw the, the lifestyle he had. 
because working so much for a lot of that is what you want. Even out of your college, keep working for that much. So I grew up very eventful and vivid. Now you can imagine that kind of lifestyle is not good for a man. So when I turned 14, I discovered that my father actually had an affair. And he had an affair with my mom's sister. And our family didn't want to share this news, they didn't want to go out. So they continued to work together in our family store. Can you imagine how awkward that was for all of us? <laughs> but we couldn't make it last. They couldn't pretend. So eventually my dad just disappeared completely. And we had no idea where he was once. Only to discover that he had been in And so it was quite a bit to take in as a 14-year-old kid. I was impressed back in the 80s and 90s. Mental health depression wasn't a thing. So I didn't know. So by the time I turned 17, depression had three years of incubating inside of me. So by the time I went to college, I started to spiral. Because I had no idea what to do with my life. I tried so many different things. I played sports, I made a lot of friends, I had a lot of girlfriends. <laughs> they all sort of let me down. By the time I started school, I realized it was not the place I wanted to be. It wasn't the school I wanted to be. All my friends had let me down. It was the church that let me down. Because honestly, I felt like God was as absent as my father. I felt hopeless. And my brother and I watched my mom's health, mental health, deteriorate every day. And she lashed out at us. We just felt like rats in the bucket, trying to keep our heads up out of the water. It's hopeless. Many of us have probably felt forever. Many of us might be feeling that right now. Church is why this message is so important. As we begin this sermon series, we want to begin to remind ourselves of this message of hope and prayer. We know, we know it's not easy. There's not always a clear answer that's obvious. The good news is that your story's not over. Just look for Joseph, this story continues. Let's see what happens to your story. For him, the angel comes. And what the angel does, how the angel tells us to respond and support, is it teaches us how we should respond in our own <coughs> First, we notice the way the angel addresses Joseph. That is, Joseph, son of David. Remember, Joseph knows the story, right? He knows who he is. He knows that Messiah is going to come from his line. And so what the angel is actually doing is not coincidental or random. It's very intentional to remind Joseph, to remind Joseph of one thing. He's not forgotten. That God sees him. God knows his name and knows who he is. So do me a favor. Turn to your name and say, God sees you. Say, God hasn't forgotten about me. That's right. God hasn't forgotten about any of us. Just like he hasn't forgotten about Joseph. As hopeless as we feel sometimes, we feel like we're so isolated and alone that no one else can possibly understand how we feel. And we also feel so cold, drawn away from God. This is not true. Just like Joseph and this woman right now, the angel is telling him, God sees you, knows who you are, and remembers the promise he made to you and your people. God hasn't forgotten. Just like God hasn't forgotten about us. Second thing the angel says to Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife. So God knows exactly what's causing Joseph's anxiety, why he's feeling so helpless. And that's what the angel leads with, don't be afraid, not bro, just marry her, right? <laughs> because God wants to calm Joseph's fears. The angel knows, God knows, that as Joseph is so anxious, as he's overwhelmed by his emotions, he's not in the place to make a decision. Nor is he in the place where he can hear God actually speak to him and experience God's grace with him. 
So it's important that Joseph will come. In the same way that we look for answers, as we wrestle through our circumstances, don't we get overcome by our emotions? Aren't we constantly stressed out because we want answers? God just wants to sit with him, take a deep breath, just like Joseph. Just let him calm your fears and your anxieties so you can truly begin to hear what he has to say next. And if you can, it takes us to our third response. And that's simply, God wants us to respond. God wants us to respond. And thankfully, this passage gives us a guide on how to do it in two ways. The first, angel comes forward and gives Joseph a set of instructions. He says, take Mary as your wife, meaning Joseph needs to accept his situation, not run from it. He needs to be able to embrace and believe that God is doing something in the impossible right now. Don't run. Accept it. As painful as it might be, God will use it. Second, the angel tells Joseph to name the child Jesus. And the name Jesus comes from the Hebrew word Yeshua. And also later on in our passage, it says that Jesus has another name, Emmanuel. Meaning, God saves Yeshua, Emmanuel, God with us. So as Joseph is naming the baby, he's literally declaring out loud over himself, God is with him. God is with us. God saves. And so as we respond, as we accept our situations, we have to declare over ourselves constantly that we believe that God is with us. That God saves. It's a promise that's meant to be held forever in our lives. We need to accept our situation and we need to declare over ourselves that God is with us. I know you might be thinking, well, that's easier said than done, Jeff. I hear you. I hear you. Let me, let me tell you the rest of my story. My grandma used to take me to church. And I told my grandma that's what I was thinking. I was a pretty bad kid, so she forced me to cry. <laughs> but I knew all the stories. I grew up in church. I met my wife. And I memorized what I needed to memorize. I even sang in the choir. But it's funny, everything that the preacher preached about, everything I learned from Sunday school, all the messages that I received, never matched up to the story of the Bible. It's just so different. And so I began to say, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I can't pretend. And so I decided, I'm never going to go back to church again. And in college, I decided to do something else. Like this. These other friends decided to experiment with drugs. You know what? When you don't have hope, you begin to do some really reckless things. This is exactly what happened to me. For the next two years, I would dedicate my life to trying every single possible drug that was out there that I could think of. Thankfully, the Lord would never let me put into control my heart. That's a story in itself of how He grew me. But everything else was free. I would find myself drinking half bottles of cough syrup or breaking open cans of the in the supermarket to feed my new addiction. It only got worse. I went to find harder drugs to stay high because I thought I was high and it happened. I needed to make that last. I remember one night waking up on my friend's couch after just a full day of party. I stood out the window and just thought to myself, what's the point of all this? What's the point of living? Who am I living for? And even if I died, who would even know or care? And these thoughts kept coming to my head. Thankfully, again, God never let me follow through with these thoughts. See, he was moving. I just didn't know. And he was doing something. I was still in school, thankfully, I failed almost all my classes. I was in probation. But I was on campus one day, and I ran into a group of friends. And they were on their way to meet their college fellowship. And they asked me to come. Of course, I didn't say no, I didn't want to do that stuff. But after that moment, I quickly realized one day that the 
multiple groups of people from my youth were reaching out to me. I don't know why I didn't recognize this before. Maybe because I was just so trapped with who I was. And one day, one of my closest friends from my grandma's church ran into me at school. And spoiler alert, that guy is not my brother. His name is also Jeff. <laughs> so my brother in law sent to me and said, Jeff, you know, you should just come back and hang out with our old friends. You don't have to like a church or go to fellowship. Just come hang out with us. I don't know why I didn't read that. I think I was just so at the rock bottom. I was depressed. I just thought, what the hell? Just hang out with them. But my biggest fear was that they knew I was basically a drug addict. I didn't want to see them. I didn't want them to see me in the state that I was. But I was so desperate that I went. To my surprise, they welcomed me back. They didn't judge me, they didn't question me. That's quite how I looked. I looked pretty bad. <laughs> they welcomed me back. You know, we picked up right where we left off. Nothing had ever happened. And in that moment, I recognized one very important thing that I was seen and loved. But I had always been by this man. I just couldn't see it because I was so trapped in my hopelessness. And because of that moment, eventually, the Canadian people went to church where I met my mentor, who would teach me about discipleship, who would walk with me for years to break my addiction, to restore hope within me, to allow me to finally rediscover the presence of God. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that. When I found hope, it was great. It's a great happy ending. No, it was hell. Facing my reality, accepting my situation, it was very difficult. Figuring out the roots of my anger, learning how to forgive my family, it was so difficult that I found myself relapsing into drug use as I was trying to get out of it. But this time, it was different. This time, I knew I was not hopeless. This time, I had a community, a spiritual family that would walk with me, that would believe in me, that would give me hope every time I would stumble. Church, this is exactly why hope is so important. I hope that as you hear this message, you're encouraged in the fact that God saved our life. Yes. But I also want you to realize there's nothing worse in your life than losing hope. There's nothing worse than losing hope in our God. I want to invite you to worship to come up sometimes. The you listen to me. The time to worship as we close. Church, I'm still learning to this day how to I won't lie to you, I've seen how God has transformed my family because of the work that He made me go through facing my realities. To this day, I have a relationship with my father, thankfully. It's not great, but it's good. Good enough for we've broken that trend of not being intimate. He hugs me sometimes. It's sort of a little awkward on the other side of it. Should I, should I go in there? <laughs> <laughs> But he will hug Eric, full on. And that's hope. That's hopeful. One day, you're going to see this trend again. Church, it's important not to lose hope. I'm going to end with this. Can you imagine what would have happened if Joseph lost hope at the end? He turns to the angel and says, No oh, thanks, I'm good. Jesus would have to grow up without a perfect father. Someone to protect him as he would flee from King Herod. Someone to provide for him as a child. Someone to teach him and instill the scriptures that would build in Jesus' life. The same scriptures that Jesus could use to defend himself from Satan in the wilderness. You see, hope isn't just for us. It starts with us. But once we receive it, it's meant to be shared. It's 
what we can take us. And so this season, as we continue, this is an invitation for all of us to hold on and also remember that your story still continues. Not just for you, but for others to hear it as well. If you're feeling hopeless, if you're here right now, or you're watching this, there's a reason for that. God wants to remind you. Your story is not done. Your story has so much hope left. Hold on to that. God, we declare out loud that you are Emmanuel. You are God with us. In the hopeless situations, God, you give us hope. You teach us how to respond. Lord, I just pray for us now as a church, any of us that's feeling a sense of hopelessness, if we're feeling like you're in a dark place, God, would you just shine your light into the darkness of our minds? see them. You know them. You know us in our circumstances. So Lord, come. As we come into this Advent season, I swear that you just need to give us larger expectations of what you're going to do this season. And allow us to align with what you're doing so that others can feel and see. I just want to also invite you all to pray. We will have some verses up here to receive prayer. I want to encourage you. Sometimes we're feeling hopeless. We just don't even have the words to pray on that. 